On today's lecture, we'll be talking about uh, magnetic circuits and uh, magnetic materials. You will see that uh, this is uh, a quite important topic because uh, the knowledge of uh, magnetic circuits and magnetic materials will be required uh, throughout uh, all the class that we have until the end of the semester. The reason is simple. We will need some magnetic circuit and some magnetic materials for every electric machine. So even if it's a transformer, you need a magnetic circuit. If it will be a motor, you will need a magnetic circuit. So today we will see the fundamentals of uh, magnetic materials and circuits so that we can later understand uh, how the machines are built and uh, what properties can we expect from them. The point is that uh, in machine construction we will be basically limited by the magnetic circuit and by the magnetic material. So the choice of magnetic materials or the availability of those materials uh, will tell us uh, how large our machine can be, uh, what will be its performance in terms of uh, efficiency for example. So uh, the understanding of uh, magnetic circuits is uh, quite important. Let's take a look on uh, uh, some schematic first. Now we'll be talking about um, the magnetic materials and uh, we'll be seeing uh, some very basic uh, properties of uh, those materials such as uh, hysteresis curve, such as uh, magnetic flux, uh, magnetic field strength, and so on. I will start with uh, a schematic that uh, can show us how do we actually obtain those properties. So how do we actually measure uh, the properties of some magnetic material. So here in this picture you see this toroidal core. So this is uh, my core of uh, my material. It, it has a form of a toroid and uh, this is the material that I will be testing. So if you would do this as a real experiment in a lab, now this toroid would be from a ferromagnetic material and uh, we can of course test any material in a similar fashion like this. So this is our sample. We need to know some geometric properties. So we need to know the cross-section here. I have marked that as S. So, so this is a cylinder. This is a cross-section that you, you see here of my toroidal core. And uh, we need to know the mean length of this circuit. In order to simplify the calculations, we are calculating, let's call it averages in our circuit. So uh, we can say that uh, our whole magnetic circuit is replaced by some line here that has this given length. Of course, uh, this is not an exact calculation. We can do a let's say more advanced calculation like that but uh, uh, this uh, simplification will allow us to use simple equations to describe the magnetic circuit. So our magnetic circuit has the length that I will call L here and this is uh, this, this circumference of the mean circle of my toroid. Now in order to do the testing uh, here I will add some coil with n1 turns. So n1 is the number of turns of uh, my coil number one. I will call that a primary coil. And uh, I will power this coil with some AC current. This is shown here as IT. This means that this is a function of time. And here we see that V1T, that's again also a function of time. And uh, in our mind experiment, this will be a sine wave, so it will look like that. 
so here is time and here we have voltage v1 as a function of time so we are feeding ac current in this coil now what will happen is that uh, this ac current in the coil will create a magnetic flux in the mag in the magnetic circuit the magnetic circuit is this it's flowing the magnetic flux is flowing like this and uh, the magnetic flux will be created by the current that we have in the primary winding so we can calculate that uh, the magnetic field strength h in my core based on this equation we have the number of turns times the current that i have in my coil divided by the length you can see here that uh, since i is uh, the ac current also magnetic field strength will be an ac variable because uh, this if you if you write uh, what is i uh, then you will see that i as a function of t will be equal to some magnitude of my current times sine i omega t and i omega is the angular frequency so magnetic field strength in my case will also be an ac variable it will be some constant given by the number of turns given by the length given given by the magnitude of the current times sine omega t so here we have a magnetic flux phi well i have it here this is my magnetic flux phi and uh, this magnetic flux flows in this magnetic circuit now on the right hand side of my toroid i have a second winding so i have uh, another coil with number of turns and two and i'm looking at the voltage that is being induced here on this secondary coil you know from physics Faraday's law so it says that uh, if you have a variable magnetic flux then you will have induced voltage in an inductor this is how we generate all currents in uh, in power plants for example we move some source of magnetic flux and we have induced voltage so here we will have some voltage that is induced on the secondary coil and we can calculate this we can find that the induced voltage is proportional to the number of turns n2 and to the time derivative of magnetic flux so in other words if uh, the magnetic flux would be some constant k times sine I omega t then if I make a derivative of, uh, of this equation then constant and sine uh, we have that the derivative of sine is a cosine function so the induced voltage will have a phase shift of uh, 90 degrees compared to the magnetic flux that has created this voltage you can also see that uh, we have here the sine minus this is telling us something about the polarity of uh, the induced voltage compared to the magnetic flux that we have here created by the primary coil but we can see again that this will be some constant it will be an ac voltage but will have a constant magnitude because here we have constant number of turns and the derivative of phi is simply given as uh, the, the sine uh, eventually cosine function uh, times the, the magnitude that we have uh, on the on the input so the larger the input current the larger will be the output voltage but we will see very soon that uh, this will be some limitation because right now we are assuming that this circuit is linear but uh, in real materials in most cases it is not 
So in real materials, uh, there is something that's called saturation. And this means that we cannot arbitrarily increase the input current uh, the, or the magnetic flux because uh, we would saturate the material and uh, we would not get higher output voltage. The last equation that you can see here on the bottom right is uh, the equation for magnetic flux. So we can calculate the magnetic flux if we know the cross section S and uh, if we know the magnetic flux density B. And we'll see on the next slide what that means. Uh, for the time being, we will forget uh, those uh, instruments on the right. I'll come back to this picture in a minute so that we see what this means. So right now we are looking for the distribution of the magnetic flux inside such a core. For this I have uh, made uh, a simulation where uh, we can actually simulate the magnetic field and we can visualize uh, the magnetic flux lines and uh, we can play a little bit with the circuit. So what you see here is a very simple configuration similar to the one as you've seen on my picture. So here is my toroidal core. You can see the material. I have chosen steel with some, some numbers in front of the, of the name. We'll see during the lecture today what that means. But let's say it's steel. And uh, here I have an inductor that is uh, wrapped around my toroidal core. So uh, it's uh, going around the core like that. Now this is a 2D view, so you can imagine like, uh, like a cross-sectional view uh, through my circuit. Uh, and uh, this material is uh, copper, and uh, I have set some number of turns here, you can see 20 turns, and uh, I have set uh, that uh, there is some current in my circuit. The remaining material is air. Now what I can do is that I can run the simulation on this circuit and uh, I can uh, calculate what will be the magnetic flux inside my core. So uh, let's take a look on that. And here we have uh, some nice color picture. This is the calculation result. What does it mean? Well, it means that uh, if you look on here on uh, the scale on the top right, you can see this is the density of magnetic flux in Tesla. And uh, blue color corresponds to very low flux density and uh, red color corresponds to a higher flux density. You can see that for my conditions that I have chosen, it's roughly 1.2 Tesla. From this picture, we can see that virtually all the magnetic flux is uh, focused in my magnetic material. So what is happening here is that this inductor creates the magnetic flux. It is focused in this magnetic material and flows like that in a circle. And uh, there is virtually no, no magnetic flux that is uh, escaping uh, outside of my magnetic circuit. We would see that uh, if we choose uh, different uh, values of, uh, of the current, for example, but uh, in toroidal cores in general, the so-called stray magnetic flux is typically very low. So we can see that uh, here the magnetic flux is being guided through my magnetic material. Now let's see what happens if uh, I change a little bit the configuration. So here I kept my toroid. I kept the settings to be exactly the same. So I have the, the same number of turns, same current. But here on the right hand side, I have added a slot that I have in my toroidal material. And if I run my calculation again, I can see that uh, now we will see something quite interesting. 
Uh, first of all, here we see that we have different colors. Now, if you take a look on the scale, it's a little bit different. So we have different values of uh, flux density. But uh, here we have some area around my slot that has significantly different values of flux density. So you can see that the coil creates the magnetic flux. It's flowing in the material, but here we have a different cross section of the material. So if I zoom in into this area, we can see that now suddenly all the magnetic flux needs to squeeze itself into smaller area and hence here we will have a larger flux density. Here you can see the magnetic flux lines that uh, they are a measure of uh, the magnetic flux density and here we can see that uh, the density of those flux lines is uh, significantly higher in this area. So if we use for example an analogy with uh, a hydraulic circuit uh, it means that uh, you would be, for example, pumping water, the coil would be the pump, and uh, this would be a pipe where you are pumping the water and you're circulating the water, and here you have uh, a small diameter in your pipe, and hence you need uh, here a larger flow speed, uh, because uh, all the water needs to squeeze itself into a smaller cross-section. And this is exactly what is happening also in uh, magnetic circuits. So it's quite easy to imagine uh, magnetic circuits uh, with uh, the hydraulic analogy. You could of course imagine this also with some electrical analogy. So you could, you could say, okay, uh, now this is a circuit, this could be a wire. And uh, if I have a slot in the wire, then the current flows but the current density will increase in this slot, in this smaller area. So uh, we can see that uh, also electrical analogy with electrical resistors uh, can be applied to magnetic circuits. Now let's go back to my slide and uh, I'll explain uh, why do we have here those uh, additional blocks uh, in the circuit? What we want to find out is uh, the so-called hysteresis curve. And uh, the hysteresis curve, it's also t called uh, a BH curve, relates me the flux density B with magnetic field strength h so i'm looking for a function that describes this behavior and uh, today we'll see why this is important for magnetic circuits so we are looking for a way how we can measure the bh curve which is uh, this function so we already have seen those first three equations. The equation for magnetic field strength, the equation for the induced voltage in the secondary winding, and uh, the relation between magnetic flux and flux density. Now if we combine all three equations together, so we can see here, okay, I'm, I'm looking for uh, dependence between B as a function of, uh, of H. So what I, what I can do is that here in this equation I have, uh, I have B. So I can say, okay, B equals magnetic flux divided by cross-section. In this equation I can see, okay, now I have a derivative of magnetic flux. So I will calculate the derivative of this equation. So the derivative of magnetic flux is equal to the derivative of uh, magnetic flux density times cross-section. Now I consider that cross-section 
is uh, not changing so it's it's with time so it's a constant and now I can take this formula and I can substitute it here in this in this equation so then it goes in there and uh, I can calculate uh, what is uh, what is the value of B and this is this is what you get you get that magnetic flux density equals to some constant times the integral of uh, the induced voltage on the secondary coil so n2 is the number of turns of my secondary winding that's uh, a known value s is uh, the cross section of my magnetic core and uh, vi is the induced voltage that i have here in my circuit so this circuit is uh, able to plot me the hysteresis curve on an oscilloscope because here I have the induced voltage I will calculate the integral of the induced voltage which is this part and then I just multiply it with some constant so uh, the output is connected to an oscilloscope and I've told you that I'm looking for a function that's saying B is a function of uh, H. So here I see that B should be the variable plotted on the Y axis. And uh, H, the magnetic field strength, should be plotted on the X axis. And from this equation here, we can see that H is proportional to current so for this reason I have this resistor here and uh, by using Ohm's law we can see say okay V on the resistor times resist is resistance times current so since uh, magnetic field strength is proportional to current it means that also the voltage is proportional to current so the voltage on the resistor is shown on the x-axis on the oscilloscope. So with this setup, we can very simply measure the BH curve of uh, any material. We just need to make a core like that from our material and uh, we can plot the hysteresis loop on the oscilloscope. Now, uh, let's take a look uh, on um, some example of uh, such BH curve. I will go back to my simulation. And uh, of course, if I am doing such a simulation, which you will be doing on the, on the lab class, uh, I need to have somehow the material library that is uh, including uh, the magnetic properties. And uh, this is already included in uh, this software that we will use for simulation. So I can simply open uh, the materials library and uh, I can open, for example, the BH curve for my steel of the core. And uh, I will just uh, show you how does it look like. So here uh, we can see the what's called a primary magnetizing magnetizing curve we can see that uh, here we have the value of H and uh, here on the y-axis we have the value of uh, flux density in Tesla we'll see uh, in today's lecture uh, also other examples uh, from um, other materials but uh, we can see, okay, it's definitely not a linear dependence. Here uh, will be the more or less linear region. And uh, here will be the region where the material is already saturated. So we increase the value of, uh, of H, but uh, the value of B increases only slightly. So uh, let's take a look on uh, how such a BH curve looks like and uh, what uh, can we read from the BH curve. 
Now the BH curve is called also a hysteresis loop. The reason is that uh, the dependence between B and H has hysteresis. Hysteresis means that uh, you get different values and those values depend on the direction that you have uh, been uh, doing in the chart. So for example, if uh, here I start at this point at the origin, I have 0H, 0B and uh, you can see this curve in red this is where you are increasing the value of uh, of h and uh, you are reading the value of b we can see that it's a not linear it's not a linear function like that and this is uh, the curve that we have seen in the software a few seconds ago and uh, this curve is what you obtain when you initially magnetize the material so the material is initially not magnetized you have uh, zero magnetic uh, field strength and then you're increasing the field and it's going like that along the curve so at the end we end here at point number E for example and this is called saturation point so I have do, been doing this. I've been increasing the value of, uh, of H and I've measured the value of B. Now what will happen if I start to decrease the value of H? And this is where the hysteresis comes in play. It means that I will not follow the same curve, but I will follow a different curve and uh, I will follow this curve like that. So now I'm decreasing the value of H and we can see that now I'm moving along a different curve and when I turn off completely the current I'm at this point marked as F here. And this point is called residual magnetism. It means that even though I have completely disconnected the current, I still have some residual magnetic field. So now I have created a permanent magnet. The value here that we have is called BR and this stands for remanent magnetism. So it's a value that is telling me how strong the magnetic field is without any current. Now obviously this will be quite important for example for permanent magnets because uh, the strength of permanent magnets can be given by the value of BR. The higher the BR, the higher the residual magnetic field that remains in the permanent magnet. So here now I co will continue to change the field strength, the current. Now know that I'm in the negative current. So I'm applying negative current and uh, I'm decreasing the magnetic field strength. However, it's still positive. So uh, here, I s even though I have negative current, I still have a positive magnetic field. And I will go up to the point here, marked as G. This point is telling me that I have zero value of B, so I have no magnetic field. But in order to achieve that, I needed some negative current. So in other words, the value of uh, this is telling me how strong the permanent magnet can resist to be demagnetized. So how much energy do I need to demagnetize the permanent magnet from BR to, to zero, like that. And this is called uh, the coercitive force. 
So we can find that uh, this will be marked as HC because this is in values of, of magnetic field. So HC is the coercitive force. And the coercitive force is telling me uh, what magnetic, what current do I need to apply uh, if I want to demagnetize the magnet. In other words, it's telling me also how is the magnet resisting to be demagnetized. Now I will continue even further to decrease the current. So I'm following this curve in blue. So we can see that now we have negative current and we will have negative magnetic flux, negative field strength. And here we go all the way to the point marked as I here. And again, this will be the saturation point. You can see from the chart that the curve is symmetric along the origin. So the value for saturation in the positive direction here, the E point, will be the same like the value that I have here in the negative area. You can see here how we imagine that uh, this uh, is working in terms of materials. Now those small areas, they represent uh, the orientation of so-called magnetic domains. So when I am at this point, all the domains are oriented in one direction. And when I'm at the other saturation point, all the domains are oriented in the other direction. This also explains the fact that uh, if I'm above the saturation point, the curve will continue like this. And there, since there are no more domains that can be oriented, they, there are or they are already oriented in, in a single direction. So this means that uh, I cannot have a stronger magnetic field in uh, the material. And now we just need to complete this curve. So I continue in now increasing my current. And uh, I'm following this bottom part of the hysteresis curve. Again here. I have the value of remanent magnetism, so this will be BR and it will be minus BR because we are on the minus axis here. Uh, so this is the remanent magnetism. So in other words, what I've done at this point is that I have reversed the magnetic field of my magnet. So uh, instead of having north and south pole on uh, one, well, on some position, uh, this positioning will be reversed and uh, again here I have the same value of uh, HC so this is uh, how much energy do I need to get in there to demagnetize the permanent magnet. So we can see that uh, the value of B actually depends on uh, the direction of H. So if I'm increasing the value of current, I'm moving along this curve like that. And if I'm decreasing, I'm moving along this curve like that. And we'll see today that uh, the area will have also some relation with uh, losses in our magnetic circuit. On the picture here, you can see the orientation of those magnetic domains. So we have already discussed this point here and this point over there. So at those two points, the material is saturated. All the domains are oriented in a single direction. So by increasing the current, I do not gain anything because I will not make more domains uh, oriented because there are no more domains available. And we can see that at this point, and at this point, that's the HC here, 
there is no magnetic field and uh, in ever on average uh, the domains are oriented in the random direction so uh, even though the domain will have some magnetic uh, magnetic orientation they will be randomly oriented so uh, they will cancel each other so remember that this BH curve is a non-linear function. Now uh, we will need to define one more term for magnetic circuit. And uh, this term is called permeability. Now permeability is uh, a value that is describing me what is this relation between B and H. Mu zero is uh, the permeability of vacuum and the mu r is uh, the so-called relative permeability. So mu zero is a constant value, you can see here the, its value, but mu r will depend on the material. Now by looking on this equation it may seem that this is a linear equation but it is not a linear equation. Now the reason for this is that uh, mu is also a function of h. So if we will be increasing the value of h this will change also the value of B. And uh, you can see uh, on this graph uh, and how it typically looks like. So we start from some initial permeability, then when we increase the current the value of mu r is increasing until we have some peak value and then it starts to decrease again. So if I keep increasing and increasing the value of H, at the end I will have a very small value of uh, mu r. And here in gray you can see the magnetizing curve. So uh, for this gray curve we would have B here on uh, the y-axis. And we can see that initially it's well not entirely linear but fairly good linearity until approximately to the point where we have uh, the value of uh, mu max the peak point and then it starts to decrease and here we see only a very slight increase of b when we are increasing h so if we are designing uh, an electrical machine, uh, we are typically designing its operating point somewhere in this region. So near the value of maximum relative perme uh, permeability and uh, also near the value of saturation point. So uh, if I would design it for mu max, it would be somewhere here. If I would design it around the saturation point, it would be somewhere here, roughly in this region. So uh, we choose a trade-off and uh, we typically design it somewhere in this area. So we have a little bit lower value of mu, but uh, on the other hand we have a little bit larger value of, uh, of B. So this is where you would actually place the operating point of, uh, of an electric machine. Now let's take a look on uh, different materials when we are looking at their permeability. So uh, we have basically three groups of materials. Diamagnetic materials, paramagnetic and ferromagnetic. Now, diamagnetic materials have relative permeability very slightly lower than 1. A typical example is copper. You can see here it has a 
relative permeability of approximately 0.9999. So the diamagnetic materials have very slightly lower permeability than one. Now what this means is that the diamagnetic materials will be very slightly repelled by the magnetic field. So if you insert this diamagnetic material into a magnetic field, it will try to push itself out from this field. But it will be only a very slight, very small repealing force. Example materials, copper, gold is also diamagnetic, water, nitrogen, for example. The second group is called paramagnetic materials. And those materials have relative permeability very slightly larger than one. You can see typical typical example aluminium 1.00002. So this paramagnetic materials will be very very slightly attracted to the magnetic field. So if you insert them in the magnetic field there will be very slightly the force will be very slight and they will be attracted to the magnetic field. Examples aluminium, lithium or oxygen. And the third group very very important for electrical machines is called ferromagnetic materials. And ferromagnetic materials have relative permeability much larger than one. So for example if we're talking around about steel it will have permeability in the order of few thousands. So this means that uh, the ferromagnetic materials will be very strongly attracted to the magnetic field. The materials are called ferromagnetic because uh, it's based on the name for iron and uh, the, la the met metal that has uh, the largest uh, ferromagnetic properties that was first invented or, or, or discovered uh, is iron. So it's iron, cobalt, nickel and their alloys, eventually also some other more rare materials. But we'll be talking uh, mostly about iron here because iron is the most common material that is used for magnetic circuits. Now let me show you what will happen in uh, the magnetic circuit for different materials. So now I will uh, again uh, run my simulation and uh, I will show you what happens if uh, I have different materials. So I have a circuit like this. Now this is a very similar circuit to the toroidal core except here I have uh, what's called uh, C core but uh, this will not change anything in the in the circuit. So this is iron to guide the magnetic flux. This is a inductor with current and th this inductor will create the magnetic flux in my circuit and here I have uh, created an air gap where I will insert different materials. So for the time being this is my sample and uh, now it is just pure air. So it's the same material like uh, around all the other circuits. So if I run this uh, simulation, uh, we will see uh, the magnetic flux lines. So we can see that uh, the magnetic flux flows in the core like that. It is flowing through the air gap, but here we see that it has a different uh, field strength because it's basically weakened when it's flowing through the air gap. So uh, in other words, the magnetic resistance in this air gap is very large compared to uh, the iron that I have here. So if we would represent this 
for example in terms of electrical resistors. Now the resistor representing the iron here would have a very small resistor, it would be a very good conductor, and the air gap here would be a very large resistor with large resistance because it will be a bad conductor for, for magnetic uh, flux. And we can see that if I, if I zoom around uh, my air gap, then some flux lines are going directly straight like that. Uh, the flux lines at uh, the, the edges of my, uh, of my uh, air gap uh, are running around it. So uh, this would be called the stray magnetic flux. It's uh, going outside of my magnetic circuit. Now the material in my simulation is air. So we can see that it's going straight through like that. Now let me change this material to iron so that we can see that this really will be attracted to the iron itself. So I'll just uh, run the simulation again. And uh, here we see that now it looks completely different. We can see that uh, the magnetic flux is being attracted to the iron here. It wants to flow through the iron because this has a smaller magnetic resistance than the air. And uh, the difference is uh, the permeability. So air, we have permeability of one and in iron we have few thousand. So the, the magnetic resistance of iron is much smaller than the magnetic resistance of air. So therefore the magnetic flux tries to find its path like that so that it's flowing through the iron. We can see that it's not flowing completely through the iron. We can see that still we have here some flux lines like that. And if this would be a magnetic circuit, this would represent us the losses because uh, we want that uh, as uh, maximum as possible of uh, the magnetic flux shows where, uh, flows where we want it here in the iron and not around it like that. So this is iron. Now if I ch change uh, the material again to something else, let's say for example copper. Now copper has relative permeability of uh, roughly one. We've seen that it's uh, it's diamagnetic, but uh, it's like point nine 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 nine. So we can see that copper in a magnetic circuit behaves like air. So it's not conducting the magnetic flux. So in order to conduct the magnetic flux, we need some ferromagnetic materials. So the ferromagnetic material will be very important for any magnetic uh, circuit. In other words, if we would not have ferromagnetic materials, the electrical machines they would still work, but uh, since the permeability here is in order of few thousands, the machines without the ferromagnetic materials would be few th thousand times less performant. Let's take a look on uh, some examples of uh, BH curve for different materials. Now what you see here is uh, not the complete BH curve, it is only the part here when you magnetize the material at the first time. So it's only this curve going from the origin up to the saturation point. So we can see that there will be different materials quite different in terms of uh, permeability, in terms of uh, magnetic flux density, for example. So if we take a look on the left here, we see that this is called electrical steel. 
and uh, we can see okay now this this curve in green this that's the relative permeability mu so uh, here we see that we have a value of roughly let's say 9500 approximately and uh, here when we are at the saturation point which will be around here probably then we are at somewhere at the 1.4 1.5 tesla of flux density uh, electric steel is a special steel that has a high content of uh, silicon uh, i will talk about it uh, also in few minutes why this is so so it's a, a steel with uh, few percent of silicon. However, there are also different materials. It does not have to be just steel. There are other materials, for example, nanocrystalline materials, that have significantly higher values of relative permeability. So, for example, you see here at this material, it's just a randomly selected material, has relative permeability of, uh, let's say, 180,000. So, compared to steel, it has relative permeability about uh, maybe one order of magnitude larger. So, uh, it's like 10 times better in terms of permeability. So why don't we use those materials? Well, there are several reasons for that. Uh, steel, compared to those materials, is uh, much cheaper. It is also much easier to process steel compared to those materials, which are typically powder materials. So the technology of uh, manufacturing is completely different. And uh, we also have uh, different uh, values of magnetic field here. You can see that here, for example, the peak of my magnetic field is approximately at 4 amperes per meter. But if I look at steel here, then I'm, it is a log scale, so uh, I would say that roughly uh, here, if uh, that's a uh, this, here we will have 10 to the power of 1 and this will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So here we would have roughly 600 amperes per meter. So uh, for some applications you need to use the steel group of materials because you need this field strength. Uh, for some other applications you can use uh, this uh, other group of materials. Now here I'm talking about steel, but uh, it's clear that uh, it will also depend on the type of the steel. What is its composition? Is it just iron or uh, has it been processed somehow? Uh, what uh, are the alloying materials? Uh, what is the composition and so on? So on this curve you see an example for different uh, alloys. Of, uh, of iron. Now if it's just cast iron which has uh, low carbon content but uh, but uh, no silicon then we can see okay we can go to few thousands of uh, ampere turns per meter but uh, we are able to achieve uh, at, mac at best something like uh, 0 0.8 tesla but here we are really at the at the saturation point. Uh, now typically we would be operating somewhere around here. So let's say 0.5 Tesla. Now if we use electrical steel, which is uh, silicon based steel, we are at this curve roughly like that. So uh, if we are working around this knee here, we have roughly 1.3 Tesla, so we are definitely more than double with magnetic flux density compared to normal cast iron. So uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, this kind of steels is used uh, in electrical machines. 
and we will see in few minutes uh, also another another reasons why this is so so uh, here are some links uh, to the manufacturing of uh, this uh, type of steel uh, you can take a look on those videos at home the first one is about the manufacturing of uh, what's called a grain oriented steel and the second one is about uh, the cutting of uh, this steel for electric machines now uh, what does it mean if I say grain oriented steel well uh, it means that the magnetic properties if I go back to uh, to the, this picture for example here you can see the the domains and uh, if I use the grain oriented type of steel it means that the magnetic properties will depend also on the direction so for example if I will have a sheet like that of uh, this uh, grain oriented material it will have some magnetic properties in this direction but other magnetic properties in this direction so for example if you're winding an inductor it's completely fine to use uh, the grain oriented steel because an inductor would in principle be something like this and uh, you can you will orient the sheets like that so uh, in this direction you will have uh, better magnetic properties and you don't care at all about the properties in this direction so the grain oriented materials have better magnetic properties in one direction and much worse properties in the other direction so they are anisotropic so for inductors that's fine and if you use a grain oriented material you will get significantly better performance but on the other hand if you are building for example an electric motor you cannot use the grain oriented material because in, in, a, in an electric motor you have a stator like that that's my inductor but then the magnetic flux at some point needs to go into the rotor and hence would go into this direction where you have very bad magnetic properties so for electric motors you need to use a material that is not grain oriented so it will have worse properties but they will be isotropic and they will be the same in all directions so this is uh, what uh, this means the grain oriented now typically the procedure if you are cutting some uh, some sheets of uh, this steel now today it is laser cutting or water jet cutting for small series of motors for larger series it is um, financially more interesting to uh, to press them in a die and uh, this is uh, this is a lot uh, faster and uh, cheaper if you're producing really large numbers of, uh, of sheets for electric machines so now we know a little bit something about uh, the materials uh, we also need to discuss what's called hard and soft magnetic materials here again you can see the BH curve here they have H and here they have uh, they have uh, value of M which is uh, proportional to uh, to to B uh, this is the magnetization but uh, it's the, the shape of the BH curve is the same we can again see the domains how they are oriented but now we have two different shapes of the BH curve the one here marked as hard is a BH curve for hard magnetic materials hard magnetic materials are difficult to magnetize and also difficult to demagnetize now what does it mean 
if the material is difficult to magnetize, it means I will need a lot of energy to magnetize it. So here, uh, I will need a large current to magnetize the to magnetize the material. If they are hard to demagnetize, is that then I follow this curve and I am at this point here. This means that they will keep some magnetic uh, field and I'm trying to demagnetize them and I'm here and again I need a large energy to remove the magnetic field from my material. We can see that for hard magnetic materials this BH curve is very wide. And we'll see in a minute mathematically that the energy that uh, is lost in my magnetic circuit if I'm periodically magnetizing the, the circuit it's proportional to the area of the BH curve. So for a hard magnetic material this area is very large and therefore I will need a lot of energy to magnetize and demagnetize the circuit. So hard magnetic materials will be very good if I want to have a permanent magnet. I will magnetize the permanent magnet once. It will be here at this point, the BR, the remanent magnetism. And then I use it as a permanent magnet. So I do not apply AC currents to that. I will just keep it here and it will produce me the magnetic fields. So permanent magnets that's where I need hard magnetic materials. On the other hand, if I am building an electrical machine such as a transformer or an electric motor, I will also need a material that is quite easy to demagnetize. And that's the soft magnetic material. So we can see that a soft magnetic material has a relatively narrow BH curve. So I need less energy to magnetize it. I am able to typically magnetize it to higher values of uh, magnetic flux density. But uh, what happens then? If I try to demagnetize them here, I will need less energy. So they are easily demagnetized, so uh, I need less energy to do that. So soft magnetic materials will not be very good idea for permanent magnets because they will be very easily demagnetized. But on the other hand, if uh, this material would be used in a magnetic circuit, AC magnetic circuit, then we see that this area compared to the hard material is smaller and hence uh, the losses will be smaller as well. So uh, soft magnetic materials are typically used for inductors, for transformers, uh, they are used also for the magnetic circuit of uh, electric machines. And here the list is uh, telling me what I want from such material. So uh, in both cases I want that they have like high saturation magnetization that's uh, that's this point or this point that's the value of BR. But for soft magnetic material I want that they have low coercitivity that's this point. For hard magnetic materials I want that they have high coercitivity so that's this point. That's how they resist uh, to be demagnetized. Uh, and uh, the result of this uh, settings, of this choice of my material, is that for soft magnetic materials I will have low core losses. We'll to be talking about losses uh, in, in, in a few minutes as well. Okay, so now that we have 
uh, an idea about uh, the soft and hard magnetic materials, uh, we can talk a little bit about permanent magnets. Because uh, permanent magnets will be also an important part of electrical machines, especially at uh, the very end of uh, the semester where we will be talking about permanent magnet machines or even uh, in few weeks where we will be talking about uh, DC machines. There are basically three groups of uh, permanent magnets. Now I'm sure that there are others but uh, those are the most common ones. The first group is called ferrite magnets. Now they were invented at around 1950, roughly, and uh, as the name suggests, they are based on uh, iron. So it's like powder iron that has been pressed and so on. Uh, they have relatively small value of Br, roughly 0 0.2, 0 0.25, so they are not very strong permanent magnets. And uh, the last column is the so-called Curie temperature. Now the Curie temperature is a temperature above which the permanent magnet will permanently lose its magnetic properties. So if you heat the permanent magnet above this Curie temperature, it will lose the magnetic field and even, the, even if you cool it back, it will not gain it again. You need to magnetize it again to be magnetic. And uh, the te Curie temperature of ferrite magnets is approximately 450 centigrades. Now the second group invented roughly at the uh, 1980s. Those are alloys of uh, typically neodymium, iron and boron in different, uh, different uh, ratios. The advantage of those magnets is that they have a very large value of uh, Br. So they have very strong magnetic field. So they are very good permanent magnets. On the other hand, based on their composition, uh, they will have lower Curie temperature. Some alloys may have something like 300, some alloys will have something like 80. And uh, the relation in general is that the higher the value of Br, the lower the value of the Curie temperature. So for those permanent magnets, the, the typical maximum temperature where they can operate in an electric motor is something like 120, 150 centigrades. And again, if you heat the magnet above this temperature, they will permanently lose this magnetic field and uh, your motor will not work anymore. It will be destroyed. So that's one quite large disadvantage of those magnets. And the third group is uh, based on uh, samarium cobalt. Uh, it was invented at roughly 1960s and uh, the value of Br is uh, typically smaller than neodymium iron boron and uh, those magnets from samarium cobalt they are also more expensive than uh, neodymium iron boron magnets. So they are less strong. But on the other hand you can typically go to higher working temperatures, let's say up to 200, 300, 250 centigrades. So if you are designing some high temperature application, then you probably will need to use samarium cobalt magnets. Uh, by the way, there is also a dependence between the value of Br and temperature. So as you are heating up the magnet, the value of Br is decreasing. So if at room temperature you will have 1.2, then uh, at, at 100 you may have 0.8. That of course depends on the temperature coefficient, but uh, you will find this in, in data sheets of uh, the magnetic materials. 
there are again two linked videos which are quite interesting so i recommend you to take a look on them first is about how those magnets are made so uh, all those magnets are typically powder based and uh, then they are pressed in different shapes and they are magnetized at uh, the very end and uh, the last video is about uh, a very strong magnet i believe they were talking about 40 tesla magnet maybe 100 i'm not sure and uh, that's the strongest electromagnet in the world in a specialized physics physics lab in uh, in the us okay now uh, at the end uh, of our lecture let me talk about losses now uh, we will have several components of losses in every magnetic circuit. So let's see this magnetic circuit that we have right here. This is my toroidal core with some length and with some cross section. And now I have one inductor here and I'm creating the magnetic flux. Now remember that this current is an AC current. So what is happening here is that I'm magnetizing and demagnetizing the circuit. So if I would plot the BH curve like that, I start at this point, zero, so I'm here. I'm magnetizing the core. Now of course, this is not the correct shape, but you have the idea. And now I'm here at the peak and now I'm starting to demagnetize the core and I'm following this curve like that now I'm uh, at this point here and now I'm magnetizing it again so I'm actually moving like that like that and like that and we have seen that the area let me let me just change the color for example to green so the area of this BH curve is proportional to the losses now since those losses are related to the shape of the hysteresis curve we call them hysteresis losses but unfortunately this is only one component of our losses so in a magnetic circuit, we will have hysteresis losses. Here we have an inductor. And uh, an inductor, that's uh, a copper wire. So the copper wire will have some electrical resistance. And uh, we can calculate the losses in uh, this uh, induct in this resistor basically as r times i squared and this is what's called jowl losses so jowl losses are the losses in the winding here so uh, we now have a second component we have jowl losses in the winding and that's still not all so uh, let's take a look on uh, and uh, well we'll see a little bit later okay so just keep in mind that uh, this is not the complete uh, complete uh, losses that we have still in the circuit the third one will be eddy current losses but for now uh, i would like to talk uh, in more detail about uh, the hysteresis losses uh, so here we see that uh, it's proportional to the shape, to the, to the area of uh, the BH curve. So we can imagine it like that. I'm magnetizing the circuit like that. And here I'm demagnetizing the circuit. So this is the energy that I'm giving into the circuit. And uh, when I demagnetize, this is the energy that I'm taking from the circuit. You can see that uh, 
I'm applying AC current, so I'm magnetizing it like that, I'm demagnetizing it like that. So it's sure that uh, the hysteresis losses will be related also to frequency. Because uh, frequency is nothing else than uh, how fast am I doing this motion? How fast am I magnetizing and demagnetizing the circuit? So if I have a larger frequency, I will have larger hysteresis losses. If I decrease the frequency, I will have lower hysteresis losses. So hysteresis losses have to be proportional to frequency. So it's not related just to this uh, the, the material itself, but it's related also to the frequency of my current that I have uh, in my in my circuit. Let's take a look on typical losses that we have in some silicon steel. Now silicon steel that is typically used for electrical machines has relatively high content of silicon. The silicon content might be somewhere in the range of let's say 2 to 5 percent. Now the silicon is added because it increases significantly the electrical resistance which will be important for the last component of the losses so-called eddy current losses. On the other hand if you are adding silicon you do not change significantly the magnetic properties. Well, you do change them, but uh, it's not such a big change as compared to the electrical properties. So what you see here in the table are selected silicon steels based on this European standard. And we can see what is the thickness and we can see also what are the losses, the hysteresis losses in our steel. Now this standard is, uh, I would say, quite uh, good in the term, in the in the meaning that uh, based on the name of the of the steel, you can directly see what is the loss and also what is the thickness of the material. So you can see M235. Now 235 is telling me what is the loss at 1.5 Tesla at 50 Hertz. And this loss is given in watts per kilogram. So for I can by looking on the steel. And uh, if I know, for example, how many kilograms of this steel I have in my electric machine, I can directly make an estimate what will be the hysteresis loss. So if I have one kilogram of the steel with this flux density and with this frequency, it will have roughly 2.35 watts. I'm saying roughly because the hysteresis loss as we have seen, is only one of the components of the total losses. But I can see, okay, it's few watts. And now I can decide, okay, I need cooling, or it will be fine to leave it to natural cooling, and so on. We can see that uh, the loss significantly changes with uh, flux density. So here, this number is the flux is the, the loss when I have one Tesla. So if I decrease the flux density, I will significantly decrease the losses. That's uh, evident from uh, this hysteresis curve. I have decreased the maximum flux density, so I have a smaller, like this for example, would be hysteresis curve. So the area is much smaller and I have smaller hysteresis loss. But on the other hand, the performance of my machine will not be as good because uh, I now have to work with only one Tesla instead of 1.5.
but note that this decrease is significant, it's not linear, definitely. And the number here, the 35, is telling me what is the thickness of uh, a single sheet of this steel. The silicon steel is produced in sheets. And again, this is related with hysteresis losses, uh, sorry, eddy current losses, as uh, we'll see in a few minutes. So 35 means that it has thickness of 0 0.35 millimeters. So we can see that, okay, we have different grades of steels and that again depends on what machine we are building. Again, uh, well, most likely uh, this is the, the, let's say, loss increase for the same steel. But on the other hand, it's quite probable that the price will be like that. So uh, the steel with lower losses will be more expensive, will probably have um, some mechanical disadvantages uh, compared to the ones. So uh, when you're designing a machine, it's always a trade-off between many, many variables that you need to consider. Now, let me talk about the third loss that we have in the circuit. Now, this is called an eddy current loss. An eddy current loss applies in AC circuits. It means that uh, if we have uh, an inductor with uh, AC magnetic flux, and near this inductor we have uh, a conductive material, electrically conductive material, there will be eddy currents. And you can see it here on this picture. Here I have an inductor. Let me just change the color back to red. Here I have an inductor and it's quite far from my material. Here I can see the flux lines around the coil. So nothing happens, no eddy currents in my material. As soon as I move the inductor near the material, now those magnetic flux lines will go through my material and this material needs to be electrically conductive. So it will have some value of electric resistance which is fairly small. And with these red circles you can see the currents that uh, will be created in my material. Now, another word how to call eddy currents is also to call them circular currents. You can see that this current flows in circles like that in my material. But now I have current flowing in my material. So this current will create also its magnetic field. And this is what's shown here in yellow. This is the magnetic field created by the eddy currents. So it means that it will try to counteract the original magnetic field that has created it. So those blue magnetic flux lines. The reason why we want to get rid of those eddy currents is that now we have a current that flows in my material. So I can again say, okay, the power that is being lost here as Jarrow losses is equal to the resistance of my material times my current squared. So if I could prevent the currents from flowing in my circuit, if for example I could divide the circuit into sections like that and they would be electrically isolated, then the current could not flow in between the sections and this would lower the eddy currents. And this is the reason why the magnetic circuits of AC electric machines are laminated. So the magnetic circuit is not a solid piece of material, but it's being laminated into thin sheets. And this, for example, is the uh, point uh, 35 
millimeter thickness as uh, we have seen in this table over there. Now if you are in a DC circuit you don't need to use this lamination because uh, in DC circuits you don't have any eddy currents because they, they appear only in AC circuits. So this is the reason for lamination. So uh, this is a lamination where we have the steel material on top of it it's electrically insulated so that the current cannot flow from one section into another so this is the single piece of sheet of uh, steel on the surface is uh, it's uh, isolated with a thin very thin layer of oxides so that uh, it's a fairly good electrical isolator and then you see they are stacked like this in the magnetic core. So if I have uh, the uh, coil wrapped around it that's creating the magnetic flux, the magnetic flux flows like that in the magnetic circuit. The eddy currents are perpendicular, so uh, they will flow, flow like that. But here they have a fairly low, uh, fairly low area so the eddy current losses will be smaller and uh, I was also talking about the resistance of uh, my sheet and if we add silicon to this steel it will increase roughly five times the electric resistance of my iron and we've seen that P equals to R times I squared so if I increase uh, the resistance, uh, the, well, by looking on this equation, it looks like that the P will increase. But that's not true, because uh, if I'm increasing the resistance here, the current will be, will be smaller. So uh, I will have definitely much, much smaller current, and uh, the total losses will uh, decrease again. So that's the reason for lamination. So at the end, uh, if we are looking for losses that we have in the iron of uh, our circuit, they have two components. They have the eddy current loss and the hysteresis loss. And here we can see how does it depend on the materials and on the properties of the magnetic circuit. Now eddy current loss depends on frequency, it depends on uh, the magnitude of B, of, uh, of B, and we can see, okay, it's typically a second power. So um, if you increase F or if you increase B, this eddy current loss is increasing faster. And this second term of my equation, that's uh, the hysteresis loss. This is basically the area of uh, the BH curve. And again, this is frequency. So if I'm increasing frequency, I'm increasing losses. But this is not increasing with a second power of uh, frequency. So for example, uh, if we have the steel that I just mentioned, the, the one from, from this table, uh, the total losses will be approximately, let's say, 3.5 watts per kilogram. And uh, from this 3.6 watts, approximately 2.2 will be the hysteresis losses. And uh, roughly 1.4 will be the eddy current losses. Now this obviously applies only for some specific value of B and specific value of uh, frequency. Now at the end let me talk uh, in the last minute uh, let me talk about how we can analyze a magnetic circuit and how we can use an analogy with the electrical circuits. Again here I have my toroid with an inductor here I have added an air gap now I can calculate the magnetic resistance 
of the core so this will be the resistance of the core and of the air gap if I use the analogy with electrical circuits and that's what you can see here I will say okay the total magnetic resistance in my circuit is a sum of the resistance of the core that's this and of the air gap now how much is it well it will certainly depend on the material so in the air gap we have air and here we have let's say iron with mu r 1000 it will certainly depend on the cross section s and the larger the cross section the smaller the resistance and it will certainly depend also on the length so the larger the length the larger the electric resistance and this is how it looks like so here is the part for the air gap you can see it's 1 over mu 0 that's uh, because here is air and mu r is 1 times d d is the distance the size of the air gap times s and for the core it is very similar except here we have mu r because here we have iron well here you could use also mu r but uh, if it's air it will be 1.0000 and then maybe maybe one at the end so this is very simple analogy with magnetic with an electrical circuit now to give you an example like a numerical example here you have the dimensions and uh, properties and you can calculate that the core resistance will be this and uh, that the air gap resistance will be will be that so in other words you can see that uh, the core resistance the iron resistance is uh, about one order of magnitude smaller than uh, the air gap so even though the air gap is only one millimeter and the core has 100 millimeters then the, then uh, roughly uh, the core resistance is uh, 100 times smaller than the than the air gap resistance so uh, i can easily neglect this iron and i can calculate just this air gap in my magnetic circuit and he will do similar simulations and calculations also on the lab class. So that's all for magnetic circuits and uh, we'll see us next week.